This next architecture that we have on the screen uh, is this Stonehenge? This is the ground plan of Stonehenge, okay. yes. And I don't know if we should get into the level of detail here, other than to say this, Stonehenge is also a monument to sacred geometry and the geometry of time. And <clears throat> some of the relationships that we found in the Great Pyramid are actually encoded here as well. Um, yeah, I would have to get into some back, background information to really analyze what we're looking at here. I will just say that we talked earlier about the, the exercise in sacred geometry called squaring of the circle. And basically that's what's going on here. And maybe we can, I can pull up a one diagram that we can look at. Here we go. Okay, so you'll notice here's a geometric template laid over the ground plan of Stonehenge. There's a little variation. The variation may amount from a few inches up to four or five inches based upon multiple surveys of Stonehenge. They've all come out a little bit different. The point here is that if you use this particular template and you were to lay the template out with absolute precision on the ground, you were then to assemble stones according to that template. What you would have would be indistinguishable from what we see there in, in ruins, right? Um, you see that the Star of David is in there and you've got a hexagon in the middle that defines the diameter of the horseshoe, um, the blue stone horseshoe that's in the middle. And then you'll see that that Star of David is enclosed by a circle, and that uh, circle defines the diameter of the blue stone circle, which was a type of, of rhyolite. Um, so it was a, they used two different types of stone. They used a sarsen stone, sandstone, and a rhyolitic, which is, a, which is a, um, an igneous um, uh, uh, rock, ultimately a lava rock. So, and here's the sarsen stone circle, and basically what happens is this. If you take the blue stone circle, you enclose it in a square, and then you precisely and carefully measure the perimeter of that square, it'll be the same measure as the circle that the sarsen stone is laid out on. And the difference between the blue stone circle and the sarsen stone circle, uh, you see, is this same as the earth radius and the lunar radius. So it's like the earth and the moon in a sense, you take those and put them tangent to each other and they solve, you know, on a three-dimensional astronomical scale, the squaring, of the, surface, the squaring of the circle exercise, which to me is a really almost bizarre coincidence that it would do that, see? But when we get deeper into the, shall we say, the biological implications of this, I think one of the things is, is that the, the, the nature of the Earth-Moon relationship is such that Without the moon, we, we wouldn't be here, right? We, we wouldn't exist. The moon being the size, the mass that it is, is, is a prerequisite for there being enough stability because the, earth, the moon actually stabilizes the earth and prevents it from rocking so chaotically that it would be impossible for higher life forms to develop. Also, because of the, the lunar tides, what it does is it, it, it allows for the creation of an intertidal zone. So the tides will cause the ocean to come up and to go back down, come up and go back down. So you've got a purely marine existence, a purely terrestrial existence, but then we have the intertidal zone, which is where the two great ecosystems come together, the great two ecospheres. And it's in that zone where you're able to get life from the ocean onto land. And if you look at this whole thing in a sort of a teleological sense, that it's not just, that evolution is not an accident, but evolution is perhaps some, on some level, it's a, it's a I, I don't want to use the word directed, because I think, of the, I think of the analogy of a permaculture system. You know how permaculture works. Initially, you're creating a system that requires a, a, la it's a labor intensive on the front end. But as it develops and, and grows and evolves over years, typically 10 to 20 years, it becomes more and more self-regulating and self-perpetuating. So when, when a, a gardener or a landscape designer or a farmer creates a permaculture system, it's a lot of work on the front end. Once the system has been put in place, it's almost self-perpetuating, see? 
I kind of think of that permaculture model for the whole earth. You see, we won't go into who the farmer was, but it's interesting that one of the Egyptian terms for alchemy translates as celestial agriculture. But anyways, you've got that moon, it creates the tides, and now you've got an intertidal zone. So if, if you were a, a great architect who was trying to create a world, and you were trying to, you know, nurture primitive marine life and eventually get it up onto the land where it can breathe air and stand up straight and have a vertical spine, etc., etc., you need that intertidal zone. Otherwise, you know, see, because that was the intertidal zone that allows those creatures to adapt to a habitat that has elements of marine and elements of terrestrial, instead of all at once. Because the, if there was no intertidal zone, some marine creature crawls out of the ocean and dies, and that's the end of the process. See, without the moon, no intertidal zone. Without the moon, the Earth would rock chaotically, and it would be much too chaotic for the... So the moon... Uh, necessary. And to me what's so beautiful and elegant about it is that the Earth-Moon relationship can be defined by this squaring of the circle exercise, the, the, the integration of or re the reconciliation of irreconcilables, the finite with the infinite, matter with spirit, rational with irrational, the circle and the square. So the, the resolution of that, and you cannot do it with exact precision geometry, but you can approach it very, very close. And see, in, the ge in utilizing geometry, whatever the ultimate life force is, it's utilizing geometry. But between the Platonic ideal and the real world, there's going to be variation. It's just like if I'm going to do a building project, and I have a set of blueprints, and it has dimensions on it, right? And those dimensions is, is on the plans, on the blueprints, can be perfectly precise. Now, I go out in the field with that, and depend, depending upon my degree of craftsmanship, I build that structure. But no matter how good I am, there's going to be a little bit of deviation between the real world and the blueprint, right? Now, over the passage of time, the structure which may have been built with a high degree of craftsmanship and conformed very, very close to the template, the blueprint template, it's going to move, it's going to, you know, um, joints are going to open up some, it's going to weather, it's going to shift around and, you know, somebody coming 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years later and measuring that, right, might be measuring something that's different than what was originally built. Then what you have to do in a sense is reverse engineer and try to figure out, well, what Units of measurement were they were they using here, but the point is is that between the ideal template and the real world manifestation of that pattern, there's going to be always discrepancies. It's the difference between the Platonic ideal and the real world that we inhabit. See, so when we look at these patterns, whether it's in Stonehenge, the Great Pyramid, the Earth Moon relationship, or all throughout the solar system, which it is in fact all throughout the solar system. What we realize is that, okay, the perfect numbers might be 10,080, or 5,040, or 43,200, right? Mars is close to 43,200 Earth days. It's a little off. But you can go through these dimensions and these proportions with just a little bit of adjustment, and suddenly it's like all the perfect numbers fall in place, right? And then you realize, okay, so here's the template of the holy city as as described in the book of Revelation, right? And you work through those numbers and you realize they're describing in verses or in, 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 um, in scriptural form, they're describing the book of Revelation has large parts of it are like architectural specifications. So when you go through and you read the description of the holy city descending out of God, descending out of heaven from God, and it describes, a, you know, a, a, a cube and it describes a circle and it gives dimensions of these, you know, 12,000 furlongs, 144 cubits, and then you actually sit down, and we do this in my sacred geometry classes and workshops, where we actually go through that, looking at it as if it was a set of architectural specifications. What you end up with is a, with is a pattern, and it's this pattern right here. The pattern that gives us Stonehenge, the pattern that gives us um, St. Mary's Chapel, the pattern, or Glastonbury, the pattern that gives us